before they're 13, the chance of them ending up an addict is almost 100%. Not only do they get addicted, they get the worst forms of addiction. They're the latest, hardest. So having somebody molest or bother a kid when they're little, you know what's sad about that? One in four women in the United States, one in four women in the United States gets molested in childhood. One in six men in the United States gets molested in childhood. Now if you take that group of people who are molested and follow them over time, between 70% of them and 90% of them, not only will end up addicted, late stage, serious, adverse consequences. Two thirds of the women in prison with addiction problems were molested in childhood. <sighs> it's a bad experience. And it's really common. It's amazingly common. Let me ask you a question. Why don't we just treat those kids? Why, why, why don't we let them turn into drug addicts? Why don't we just give them some help, give them some support? Why don't we wait until they turn into drug addicts? I don't get it. The third most common risk factor is anxiety or depression or boredom. You don't feel right. You feel different than other kids. When you try a drug, it feels too good, works too well, you like it too much, then what happens? The drug turns on you. It always does. Now, what you try and stop, you're worse. Okay, now this phrase says acquired hypofrontality. Remember when we were talking about how when the drug is in front of you, your brain can talk you into it? We call that denial. Another term for it is called hypofrontality. Hypo means low. Frontality refers to the part of the brain right behind the forehead, right, right here, frontal lobe. That's the part of the brain that makes decisions. That's the part of the brain that says, don't do that. Or, yeah, <laughs> that's the part of the brain that says, don't do it, it's gonna hurt you. Or, go do that, you're gonna like it. Unfortunately, drugs damage that part of the brain. Really bad. So the part of the brain that would tell you, don't do it, doesn't work, especially when you want to use it. Now, a lot of things can produce that. You know, if, if you're just putting in plain English, it's people who get bad judgment for one reason or another. They don't use their judgment because their brain doesn't judge right. If they, moms, when they were carrying them in their pregnancy, used alcohol. If their moms used tobacco. If their moms used meth. Those kids will be born with different brains. And their brains aren't, they're gonna like, not like the way they feel. They're gonna feel negative or bored. And those kids are very, very high risk for addiction. You know if any of your moms used when they were carrying you? Did you know that you were born with the risk factor? That this wasn't your fault? You're not believing me, Sadie. <laughs> you think it's your fault, don't you? It's not your fault, girl. It's not your fault. When you were developing in your mom's tummy, the drugs that she used changed your brain. In particular, it changed the decision-making part of your brain. Let me give you a hint. You don't have good judgment. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> if you were asphyxiated at birth, if you're a little preemie, if you got dropped on your head, all these things mess up the way your brain works. And those people can really get in trouble with drugs because they don't think straight, you know? Now, in addition to having a risk factor, for someone to get addicted, it depends upon when they started using and what was going on in their life when they started to use. What do I mean by that? You, you explain to me. Kelly, explain to me. Let's two girls. Girl A, she's pretty and popular. She's a good student. She's a cheerleader. Everybody loves her. She wears just the right clothes. <laughs> she goes to a party and someone gives her a joint. That's the first girl. Second girl, she's neither pretty or popular. <laughs> she's not a good student. Her parents just got divorced in Minnesota and they just moved to Chico. Her mom and her moved to Chico. She misses her dad. Every night she cries herself to sleep. She started cutting on herself to feel better. Now, she, by some accident, got invited to a party and someone gave her a joint. Same gender, same age, same drug. Which young woman is more likely to get in trouble with drugs and why? I think the one who 
because it's all for his parents to stop the worst things that he and she's going through all the stuff like depression and stuff like that. You're exactly right. Can you see that for that second girl, when she goes to the party, she's going to be shy and awkward and you're going to know people. She takes the hit off a joint, she relaxes, she fits in. And what's going to happen the next time she goes to a party? Yeah, and it'll work for her. And so very quickly, she's going to know she's better off if she's high at a party. She started down the road. Now, sooner or later, of course, the drug will force tolerance on her brain and now she's really stuck. But you can see that what was going on in her life when she first started to use was a big factor in keeping her using. So if you look at the kids and the adults in my practice who are drug addicts, a lot of them are kind of fooling around with drugs or smoking weed or drinking a little bit. Death in the family, parents got divorced, dog got run over, their house burned down, something bad happened. And right away their drug use just blows up. You see the connection there? It's not an accident that the drug use blew up. Bad things make people want to get high. So if there's a tragedy in your life, watch out, the drugs will work. And the next time a tragedy comes, you can't wait to get high. With me? So that's really what's meant by the drug and the circumstances of first use. Now the drug means something different. Let's suppose that the first girl, the popular pretty one, her first drug is weed. But the second girl, her first drug is someone hands her a pipe and she takes a hit of crystal, which is more likely to get into trouble. Let's say there's two beautiful popular girls, both cheerleaders. They both go to a party, one smokes a joint and one gets a uh, pipe full of crystal, which is more likely to get into trouble. Why? Much stronger. It's like a big loud drug. You get deaf real fast with crystal. Your pleasure centers, even people who just use over one weekend, boy, for the rest of the week or two after that, they're fried. And no interest, no pleasure, no nothing in them. They're just burnt out. So depending upon which drug you stumble into, it can get you or not. It can get you or not. Now, an enabling system is part of it. In an enabling system, that's, a, that's the people around you that make it easy for you to smoke or use. Enabling means it makes it easier for you to do it. So for example, if your parents all smoke cigarettes, they're not gonna tell you not to smoke cigarettes. I'm your dad. <laughs> Why are you smoking cigarettes? How much credibility do I have? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm concerned about her, I love her. Too. Well, I know, but I'm a grown-up. I can make a choice in this. She's a kid. It don't matter. What? It don't matter. You mean, um, not, not being a hypocrite. You're being a hypocrite. Can you see that if people around you, your parents are all using, it makes it easier for you to do it? Have you seen people who make it got who were doing okay until they got a car? Cars enable people to get in a lot of trouble with drugs. You yeah, pick your friends up. You know, you know, to tell fire up before we go. You know how it goes. Let's suppose you you try to bike it in. It was nice. It was okay. It was, you liked it. But then your brother broke his leg, and he has bottles of Vicodin on the cabinet next to where he's healing his leg. Uh, what are you thinking? <laughs> so the presence of a lot of drug in the environment enables use, right? I mean, there's a big difference between somebody who has to pay 250 for a Z versus somebody who's growing their own, right? So if you see people growing their own, they have much bigger habits, right? Because having all that dope enables them to smoke a lot of dope. So it's very useful to look at what's making it happen. Uh, because that's what's going to continue. Unless we can figure out a strategy for all of these, nothing's going to happen. So the what I'm going to ask you to do is apply the biopsychosocial model to yourself to see if you have risks for this disease. This slide shows you the kinds of questions I want you to ask yourself uh, when you're deciding whether or not you have risk. First of all, uh, we have to look at your genetics. Does alcoholism or drug addiction run in your family? Were you truly bored in school? Were you hyperactive? Can you hold your liquor better than others? 
That's called intoxication resistance. It means it takes more for you to get high than other people do. In terms of the kind of traumatic things that happen that make people want to use and, and make the drug work too well for them, did you suffer trauma, physical or sexual abuse during your childhood? Did you experience any other life-changing difficulties? Mental illness is a big factor, and about one in four addicts have a mental illness. Do you have a parent or grandparent who has a mental illness, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia? Have you been diagnosed with a mental health problem? Do you become really anxious or depressed or unable to sleep when you stop using alcohol or drugs? How strong the drug is and how old you were when you first started using are big factors. How old were you when you first started using alcohol or drugs? How long did it take before you were using regularly? We also know that what was happening in your life when you started using it can influence whether you continue or not. What was going on in your life when you first began using? Good time or bad time? What benefits did you give me, did using give you? Did you make did it make depression, anxiety, pain go away in a way that made you want to repeat it? Finally, it's important to understand the glue, the thing that keeps the whole thing running, that's called enabling system. How easy was it for you to get alcohol or drugs? Uh, did your parents or peers approve or disapprove of your use? Those are the kind of questions that I want you to think about. This is an example of a family tree. And this is Daryl's family. Uh, now, in Dar this is Daryl. And if we go back in his background, this is his dad's family, and this is his mom's family. Is that right? Huh? This is his mom's family. This is his dad's family. So if you look at his mom's family, one of his, which one is the mom? This one? Yep. Mom isn't a drug addict, but she smokes tobacco. All four of her brothers drink, use drugs, drink, and smoke. They got the full disease. They got the whole thing. And one sister. So his mom smokes tobacco, but all of her brothers and sisters are drug addicts. This is his father's side of the family. His dad drinks and smokes, and his brother and sister, one's a drug addict, one drinks and smokes. If you go up to his dad's, mom's dad's side of the family, both of them drink and smoke. If you go up on the mother's side of the family, his, this is his grandmother smokes, his grandfather smokes and drinks, and his great-grandfather smokes and drinks. Now, if you look at this coming down to Daryl, can you see that there's a lot of people in his family background with the disease? Now, the question would come up, how did he not get the disease? Well, the answer is simple. Number one, he did get in trouble, but because he'd seen people in trouble, he knew to step back. He knew what trouble looked like. The other thing that he did was he found other ways to deal with what the gene causes. In other words, you can't ignore what the gene does. If the, let's say that the most common symptom that the gene gives you is you're born bored. And we understand that drugs work better than bored kids, right? Let's suppose he didn't want to be a drug addict. Advise him. What were you going to tell him? He's got this family background. They're all drug addicts. It's coming right down to him. What would you tell him? What would you tell him? Break this cycle and not do whatever you want to do. But he can't just not do it because he's bored. What should he do? Other things. That's the answer. Exactly the right answer. He needs to do other things for fun. Because if he doesn't, drugs will work way too well. What's the single best way of preventing addiction if you have the gene? Your answer is the right answer. Other things for fun. If you had to pick fun things. Sports and exercise activate the pleasure centers naturally. 
<coughs> so one of the things we teach our patients is you can't just stop using the drug. <coughs> you leave a big hole in the middle of your head. You won't like it. You gotta put something else where the hole was. If you can't find another way of getting pleasure, why would you stay sober? You can't stand it. You won't like it, right? So one of the tricks to not getting addicted or one of the tricks of getting off a drug, don't just stop. You've gotta have a plan for something else that's gonna hold your interest. There's a problem with that. What if you were born born? The things that other kids get interested in aren't gonna interest you very much. So other kids could say, oh, I'll just do this or I'll do that. Leave you cold. So kids with the gene, it's much harder for them to find things that are interesting because they're bored all the time. They can't find something interesting. They're toast. They're history. They're addicts. It doesn't have to be, it's, it, you put it exactly right, it doesn't have to be sports. Anything that's fun turns on the pleasure centers and protects you from being an addict. Music does. Dancing does. Video games do. Taking care of animals does. Being with your friends does, if they're sober. A lot of ways of activating the pleasure centers. Someone with the gene must do them. Or you're going to be bored not like the way you feel. You're going to use drugs. You're going to like those. You with me? Okay. So this is an example of an inheritance pattern that is very common in addicts. Your family history of addiction? Your family history of addiction? Your family, family history of addiction? Not so much. Your family history of addiction? So were you born bored? 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 Do you have trouble getting interested or staying interested? Mm -hmm. How about you? How about you? How about you? How about you? Not at all. Okay. So that's what inheritance means. This is the name for what people get. People with the gene for addiction are born bored. And they can either be an addict. There are other ways you could turn on your pleasure system and lose control of them. So in families that have the gene, one sister might be a drug addict. The other three sisters would never touch a drug. But one of them's a gambler. One of them's a big shopping addict. One of them can't not eat huge amounts of food. They all have the disease, but they're using something else to turn on their pleasure system and they're just as addicted. Uh, they're just as much trouble, except instead of drugs, it's food or it's sex or it's gambling or shopping or something else that makes them feel good, and they get in trouble with it. Or they have ADD. We now understand that people with a family history of addiction are at very high risk of getting attention deficit disorder. First thing you know is ADD is not a disorder. It's a difference in the brain's wiring, and people with that wiring actually have an advantage if they're in a situation where everything's new to them. Their brains are at a big advantage. So if you were born bored, if you travel abroad or if you get into a new environment, your brain is better than anybody else's. You know that really alive feeling, that really focused, sharp feeling? That's, that's the way, that's the advantage the ADD brain has. If it's not full-blown ADD, we would call it reward deficiency. You're born bored. You're deficient of reward. You don't have enough reward. So that's the name for the most common risk factor for the disease. Wouldn't it be neat if we just went out and asked kids if they had a family history of addiction, if we could find the ones that were bored, really work to find things to get them interested, so they wouldn't have to turn into drug addicts. Wouldn't that be easy? Wouldn't that be cool? Why don't we do that? Shame on us for not doing that. Now, unfortunately, and this is a little late for you guys, turns out, and I think you guys know this, the brain keeps on developing until you're between 20 and 24. So at the age of 15, your brain, especially the frontal lobes, the part that make decisions, not quite fully developed. If you start using drugs, early, the brain stops maturing. And you end up with 
a lifelong problem making good decisions. Drugs stop brain development in a bad way. So look at what happens. These are kids who began drinking alcohol. And the question that this slide shows is, how many people will end up addicted, depending upon when they started, okay? Now, what the slide says is if you start drinking at age 13 or 14, the chances of you ending up an addict are almost 50-50. So early use really bonks your head and you just don't develop. Doesn't mean that we can't help it heal. In other words, this is bad news because all you guys started at a young age and you really interrupted your brain development, take it from me. That's not the end of the road though. We now know ways of making this heal. And it's essential that you make them heal. Notice what happens if someone waits to start between 17 and 18. The risk falls by half. So there's a huge change, big leap forward in brain maturity when you go from 17 to 18. So if we could just talk people into waiting until they're a little older to start, the number of people who get addicted could fall by half. Too late, but that means that we need to work to get your brains back on track. We can heal the damage, honest we can, but just starting early means that you have a big risk of turning out addicted. Did you know that? Did you know that? I mean, what? I wish we could tell people, wait a minute, wait a minute, everybody likes drugs, but if you start too young, it's going to change the way you live the rest of your life because you're going to end up really hurting the way your brain works. It's not worth it. Don't do it. Wait until you're older to get messed up. <laughs> this is the data on sexual abuse, and I described it for you. Defined as unwanted sexual contact before the age of 13. One in five to one in four women were molested. One in seven, one in five men were molested. In a famous study done by Doris Rosenau, of people who were really serious addicts, 71 to 90 percent of them were molested in childhood. This is bad news. Of men, same thing. So what we have is a whole population of kids who if we can't identify them and help them when they're little, they're going to turn out to be drug addicts. We've got to get busy here. We've got to help these people. We also know if we give them help, they don't turn into addicts. We can prevent it. It's very good news. Now, this is a summary slide. On this side are all the things that increase the chances that somebody trying a cigarette, smoking a joint, having a drink, will continue to do it and get in trouble. Your parents, childhood trauma, unwanted sex, mental illness, ADD, all of these create the risk. For example, we know that kids who have acne or who are heavy get teased. And when you get teased, you feel bad. Don't use drugs when you feel bad. Why, Danielle? Because it gets worse. Because it'll take away the bad feeling right away. <laughs> it works to take away bad feelings. Gay kids, boy, in America, gay kids get tortured. And don't use drugs if you feel bad because it'll take away the bad feelings. So these are all things that make it likely that that... No, this is good news. This is very good news. These are things that, if you have a risk, protect you from getting the disease. Not everybody who has the risk will get the disease. And the reason why they don't get the disease is that they did things that filled the hole, that fixed the damage, that corrected what was wrong. If you have a good relationship with an adult, if your family sits down and eats together, if you belong to clubs, uh, if you're in sports, that's really powerful. Uh, if you do music or drama or dance, those are other ways of having fun. You put it perfectly. You gotta have other ways of having fun or you'll be bored. That's what this means. People who go to church use drugs less. Very interesting research. We've done research where people were really in trouble with drugs. We gave them a puppy to take care of. And when they started taking care of the puppy, their drug use went down, their alcohol use went down. I asked one of my patients the other day, I said, how come you're not using so much? She goes, 
my horse doesn't like it when I get stung. <laughs> I don't want you know. And so she's not getting high anymore. And it really has helped her get sober. Really has helped a lot. Volunteering to help other people. Working and being around other friends. If you're in an environment where nobody likes for you to use. These are all protective. And not only are they protective, if you were born with the gene, if you started using early, those things heal the damage. So if you were, have a family history of addiction, Danielle, and you were aware that when you were little, you're sitting in a classroom and you're bored and you know, you're staring out the window and you're doodling and stuff. At that age, if we had gotten you into gymnastics or dance class or music class, it would be hard to find something interesting, but if we found it, she would be the best at it. Why? That's the right answer. She will work harder for it. It's exactly right, IBA. Kids, when they, kids with boredom, when they find the thing that turns them on, you can't stop them. They're the best because that's the way they really feel the best. They like it. They want to do it. And they're the best artists. They're the best musicians. They're the best athletes. And they throw themselves into it and they love it. Yeah. Well, when I was low, I did cheerleading for like four or five years, and that was something I was dedicated to. But then, once I hit high school, I just threw it all away. When you stopped doing cheerleading, which really was good, you started using drugs. Does everybody get the connection there? Uh, the hole was um, okay. Explain this, Javier. Kid comes into my office. He's 16. He has a lot of family history for addiction. Parents, grandparents, uncles, they're all alcoholics and drug addicts. Now, when he was born, he was a very active little boy. Because actually, technically, you're not born bored. Technically, you're born curious. But curious kids get bored easy. <laughs> so if you can keep their curiosity satisfied, they're no trouble. But if they get bored, whoo, watch out, they're going to get in trouble. So when he was two, they got him into tumbling class. When he was five, they got him into gymnastics. When he was like six, seven, and eight, they got him into Pop Warner, Little League, soccer. By the time he was like in eighth grade, he was a jock. And he was like, in sophomore year of high school, he lettered in four sports. You know, he wasn't a particularly talented athlete, but he was the, beloved by his coaches because he would barge through the line. He was the first guy to come to practice, the last one to leave. Because he loved it. He felt best that way. He wasn't really using drugs anymore. You know, jocks drink on the weekend. But he really wasn't in trouble with drugs at all. He broke his leg. Six months later, he was in my office, 16, drinking a quart a day. Hard liquor. What happened? Nick, what happened? We died? Nope, not yet. <laughs> Say it again, Javier. He got very depressed. He couldn't satisfy, he couldn't fill the hole. He couldn't exercise, he wasn't in sports, he couldn't do anything. He just sat there, out of his mind with boredom. That's like me, because when I was little, I played for the Oregon Rhinos, and then I went camping with my brother, and then we got in a fight, and he picked up a big ass rock and threw it back of my head. And I can't play football no more, because I got a head injury. Mm -hmm. It cracked my skull. Mm -hmm. So you're the kind of guy who, if boredom comes your way, one of the major things that would protect you, you can't do. For you, developing interest in exercise or music or something is a matter of life and death, dude. You understand that? What, you're tr what I'm trying to get you to see is just because you have risk factors doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. Just because you have the disease doesn't mean you can't get out of it. You have to fix what's wrong. If you fix what's wrong, drugs don't work anymore. You don't need the drug if you can fix what's wrong. And you got it right a little minute ago. If the problem was boredom, you can't afford to be bored. You got to find something for fun or you're in trouble. And it will really be big trouble. Okay, so let's go back to the BIPSOM. First question you need to consider is, so let's say that we're talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
want to be anatomically correct here. So we would ask her. So, <laughs> you think so too? God, I've always thought I was a great artist. No one but me thinks so. <laughs> I mean, can you see the depth in that, man? Can you see the wit and wisdom in it? Okay, so listen, where'd it go? Whew. All right. So there she is. She came to you, and she wants to know, you're trying to help her understand whether she could be an addict or not. So the first thing you want her to do is say, do you have a family history of addiction? Secondly, do you have a tendency to boredom? Do you have a diagnosis of ADD? Now, while I'm saying this, at any moment I could turn to you and say, why is that a risk factor? They're most likely to use it. And it'll work too well. Yeah, it works. That's why you, That's why you keep doing it. It's going to work. You got it just right. That's exactly right. Are you anxious or depressed? Have you been messed with? Do you have, have you had a tragedy in your life? Have, you know, things that upset you terribly? If you get stressed out, do you use to relax? Did drugs enter your life at a tough time? You understand why that's risky? Works too well? Are all the people around you users? Too bad. So if the answers to those questions is yes, whoo, you got some risk going on here. How do you stack up on that? How do you step up on that? What? Step up in that? Yeah, how do you write right on that list? Do you have risks? Yeah, she's most likely mm -hmm. to start using. Mm -hmm. So you, you have the risk factors for using, do you? I think so. You don't have, don't, none of those risk factors? You have family history. Right. So you have the, but so so are you easily bored? Are you easily bored when you're sober? <laughs> <laughs> I think you made my point, dude. <laughs> okay. So the first thing we would ask somebody to do is, you better know if you're one of those people who can't use. You just better know, and she'd better know if she's one of the people who can't use. <laughs> Because if she's one of the people, I mean, I would want her to know that she couldn't. I mean, look, we're, we're being humane here, right? Okay, so. Now, the second question that we would ask her, so she cops to saying, okay, well, you know, I do like to have, you know, a, a little weed now and then. Um, yeah, I smoke a little tobacco only with my friends, and I'm definitely not addicted. Um, I tried Vicodin once, and whew, it was great, but I would never do it again. So we'd say, okay, well, you've had a little substance use. Let's see if you're getting into trouble. Still the risk factors. Huh? She's got the risk factors. Let's assume she got the risk factors. Now we're going to move a little further. So we're going to ask her to take a look to see if she's starting to get in trouble. What are the signs she's starting to get in trouble? Now, you can tell me which principle these questions illustrate. Are you using more often and are you using greater amounts? What does that reflect? Tolerance. Right? Have you developed tolerance? So if anybody admits tolerance, boop, they just fell into a whole different group. They now don't have normal brains. Secondly, if your use causing you trouble, um, or grades, or friends, is she hooking up with people she doesn't even know and like? Uh, is she spending money she doesn't have? Is her health falling down? Those are adverse consequences. Does she develop craving, especially under humus conditions, environment withdrawal, mental health, or stress? If craving comes up under those circumstances, she's in trouble, big trouble. What does this one talk about? When you crave it, can you talk yourself into it? Remember we were talking about the denial process, how that if you want it enough, you can talk yourself into it? That's a sign you're getting the disease. If when you shouldn't, you can talk yourself into it, that's a bad sign. Now this is a critical question. If you've decided you're really not gonna do it, you've resolved not to do it, do you find yourself doing it anyway? Especially, in other words, are you in charge? Or is the craving monster in charge? Are you in control? Or is the craving monster in control? Are you the one saying do it or don't do it? Or is the disease saying do it or don't do it? Well, if you can talk yourself into doing it when you said you weren't going to do it, especially when you're around it, that's the, that's the acid test. That's the key test. You got it. 
you're in trouble. Now here's what I would ask her to do. She's mad, she's upset. Why are you in my face? Why are you telling me I'm a drug addict? I'm not a drug addict. Say, so, okay, well wait, 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 wait. This is the easiest disease in the world to diagnose. This is the easiest thing in the world to know if you've got it. What's the easiest way to diagnose if you have addiction? Your family. Mm -mm. How do you know if you've got it? Because if you take some more than and you nope. try nope. because you crave it. Nope. Those are all symptoms. How can I make the diagnosis in 100% of the people with the disease? Easiest disease in the whole world to diagnose. Well, all you have to do is don't do it. If you're not addicted, no problem. If you're an addict and say, uh, if, if you say, I'm not going to use, and you don't crave it, you don't talk yourself into it, you don't get funky and blue or anxious when you stop. If it's no struggle, God bless, you're not an addict. But if you say, I'm not going to do it, and then you do it, who's in charge? Not you. Not you. You're not in charge. The craving monsters got you. So the simplest thing, man, if, if I was talking to her, if I would say <laughs> every kid in America, if I had the opportunity, I'd say, look, Find out if you're an addict or not. First, know if you're at risk. I mean, find out if you're at risk. Don't do the experiment if you don't think you get any chance. But if you think you're at risk and you're using substances, very easy to find out. Just don't do it. Don't do it. And if you're not an addict, it won't be hard. If you're an addict, so make a resolution. I'm not going to do it. Go about your usual day. Don't go sit in a cave in the dark and hide from it. Go to parties, go to your friend's house, do the stuff you do. Don't make it easy. I mean, don't like go into a coma. Make, put yourself around the drug, because that's what's going to make you want to use it. If you're not an addict, no problem being around the drug. If you're an addict, you can't do it. So put yourself around the drug. Every day that you don't use, or every hour that you don't use, score your craving. Remember, you won't have craving unless you're an addict, right? Right? Right. So if you just say, all right, tell him don't do it.